sitting here reflecting on all the things I got to introduce to you right now, and it's a little intimidating. Um, there's cases that are hard to summarize, and this is one of them. Let me start off here. Robin Leonard. Um, I've done this long enough to know homicide trials wind up being the subject matter of the whole trial winds up being a defendant to the accused because we got to prove them guilty. They did it. You know what their mental uh, acuity was in doing it. You know they intended to do it or whether it was reckless or that kind of stuff. Um, the focus winds up being over there. But I want to start off by talking about the person who will not testify in this trial this week, Robin Leonard. She is a subject of this case, too. She's the one who died. That's a picture of her when she was alive. Um, and you're going to hear in this proof uh, testimony from her son, Alexander Leonard. He's grown now. And you're going to be able to tell how proud he was of that woman. <clears throat> He's going to tell you his only child. Uh, she had him when she was in her 20s. She had dropped out of college, um, was alone raising him. She waited tables, she bartended, tried to make ends meet. Went back to school while raising him and working. Got her bachelor's degree in psychology and then started trying to get her master's degree in the same. She wound up getting that master's while raising him. He, he'll tell you that when he was in the fourth grade, she was his PTA president at his school. She got that master's and started teaching college courses, Northeast State, ETSU, different places, eventually becoming full-time on the faculty. Now, we, people will call her professor because that's what you do in college. Everybody's a professor or a doctor, whether they got a doctorate or not. She just had the master's degree, so she was a full-time uh, instructor, kept a full course load and all that kind of thing. Um, not quite a professor because that's a, that's a term I think they assigned to other people, but um, she did well enough that as a single mom, she worked enough to be able to get her a house. Got a loan for it. Um, back, I forget what year he said, uh, around, around 2017, about 2017, on 825 Hamilton Street in Johnson City. Now, where that is, um, and this will be important to notice, on West Market, where I go by fast food places, <laughs> there's the McDonald's there, there's Amigos across the road, there's the Indian place, that's, that's where I'm at on West Market. Going toward the mall, up toward John Exum, right there where you would turn at the CVS, left on the Knob Creek Road, that intersection, there's a little gas station there in the park, and the Veterans Park is just to the right. Uh, that's the intersection we're going to be talking about. You turn right toward the VA, go up a couple blocks, turn left onto Hamilton, and she's just a few houses into there. Okay, She's not on the downtown end of Hamilton. She's on the uh, VA end. She's not far from the VA. Very close to her work. Okay, So that's where she was living. Maintained that employment as a professor. But on January the 18th of 2021, that all ended. Came to a halt. That's her front porch. The final place she had a seat at her house that she had bought. She was bleeding profusely. She was going downhill quick, fast. There's a 911 call you're going to hear very soon in the proof where it, it's dialed in, no one's really talking, and then someone says something 
and it's please Annette don't hurt me please something like that and you hear another person saying I'm not and it's it's faint it's hard to hear but you'll hear it and I want to tell you some of these these recordings that we play in this case you you'll get one here in the in the courtroom uh, they become exhibits and in your deliberations if you wish to hear something again you just knock on the door ask a bailiff hey we want to hear exhibit whatever and judge will let you come in here and listen do what you want to with those exhibits so so you don't have to sit there and worry oh gosh I don't I didn't really catch that you you entitled to do what you need to in your deliberations but you're going to hear that call and then it just clicks off we don't know why it just ends so what's 911 do they try to call back um, minutes later there's finally an answer and you're going to hear the voice of Robin Leonard and you're going to hear a woman who is going down in a hurry she's struggling to talk to communicate but you're going to hear one thing out of her that is clear and that Harvey did this you'll hear it John C fire department is the first first responder to get there um, I think they got a little mixed up on where the distance was because there's a fire department uh, he's not coming from far but they have to get the location because they're not really getting good direction uh, Lieutenant Rick Casey is the first one to make contact with Miss Leonard and Miss Leonard tells him also Annette Harvey did this of course nobody knows who Annette Harvey is that she's talking about at that point they don't even know her name because she can't talk well enough to do it and Lieutenant Casey's going to tell you that he accompanied her on the ambulance down to the medical center and she's just going to where she's non-responsive she lost blood her uh, she actually coded in the hospital they got a pulse back but then she was basically on life support for about 11 days 10 11 days until January 29 when the plug was pulled <coughs> she at that point had no useful brain activity to live on her own and it all happened as a result of Annette Harvey on January 18th so let's talk about Annette Harvey that's her later that day uh, in Bristol Tennessee uh, near the Pizza Plus where the Bristol Police Department found her a few hours later she's charged with first-degree murder in two different ways there's two two forms of first-degree murder there count one there's count two there you treat you look at them separately okay the first one is the one you know of the most the intentional and premeditated killing of another person the second one um, we didn't talk to you really about it during jury selection but it's a killing that's perpetrated in the commission of a particular felony in this case aggravated burglary because the proof's going to be Miss Harvey knew not to be in that house she was told not to come in that house but she entered and she remained with the intent to commit an assault and that assault resulted in death of Robin Leonard and thus this is a form of first-degree murder now this is where um, this gets complicated because I've got to give you background of how we get to January 18 at 825 Hamilton Street and that background starts Friday the 15th the 18th is a Monday okay Monday and it's Martin Luther King Day if I recall um, the previous Friday at um, in the evening there's a there's an event happens at David Crockett High School they're having a basketball game that night and Annette Harvey has called 911 from somewhere 
uh, down uh, the southern end of the county, and she's telling the 911 people that she thinks someone's following her, she's in danger, so on and so forth. Um, I believe they, they tell her to, to go somewhere where there's people or something like that, they're, what they're trained to do. She winds up going to David Crockett High School. Um, you're going to hear from the SRO, the student resource officer who was there on duty, uh, working there that um, she runs past the ticket table where you pay for your ticket and uh, goes somewhere, not into the ball game, but somewhere else. And he's going to tell you how unusual she was acting. I think he told me that he thought she was on drugs. But she's not alone. She's got two young girls with her. I forget the ages, but they're like pre-adolescent. They're not toddlers and they're not teenagers. They're with her. And uh, Officer Schaefer, the SRO, um, I don't know if he contacts the patrol division to come deal with her um, or they just came anyway because she'd already made a 911 call. He'll, he'll tell you that they were already sort of trying to figure out where she was so they could talk to her. Um, but they respond and suddenly they're, they're confronted with Miss Harvey who is not acting normal in their view and long story short, I believe they give her a choice. You either go to the hospital to get checked out or we're gonna have to put you in jail for whatever charge we got that we can think we can make on you. Um, DCS gets called out because there's children there. And there's concern about their welfare and very soon it's decided that, you know, these kids can't go to the hospital with her. They can't go, somebody's got to deal with these children. Somebody's got to look after them. Now, some background. Miss Harvey, up until January 2021, resided in New Jersey. And the car you become familiar with for her, and a, little, a later model Camry, it's got New Jersey plates. And I believe it's titled in the name of her, um, husband or significant other, whatever you want to call it, Michael Slattery, okay? Um, that's how you spell his name. They had had a relationship for many years, they had children together. Um, she, when she's told people that people are following her and all that stuff, she's telling them she's been part of a religious cult that's either led or participated in by Mr. Slattery, talking about how dangerous he is, how her and her children are at risk, and um, so on and so forth. So law enforcement's starting to hear this stuff, and they don't know what, they, they don't know how to take it. This is something in New Jersey, allegedly. But she starts saying this. So what do, what do you do with the kids? The reason I mention the New Jersey part is her people aren't around here, okay? In DCS, when they've got to place a child in an emergency situation, they'll look to you, you know, is there like relatives around here that could look after these children? And we don't have to stick them in foster care because that's not what you want to do if you can help it, right? So the dialogue starts with <laughs> Ms. Harvey about, is there somebody that could help uh, with your children? And she starts giving some names. She comes up with uh, Rebecca Lewis, call her Becky. Um, she's a lady that went to school or, or sort of grew up with Miss Harvey. Miss Harvey was originally from around here, had gone to Tri Cities Christian School. And uh, some of the people you hear in this case are people that she went to high school with, including Miss Leonard. Um, anyway, Becky had gone to school with her. She's going to tell you she really hadn't stayed in a lot of contact with Miss Harvey, but she's working at her job in uh, Bristol. I think she was working from home. And uh, gets a call to come out to David Crockett High School all the way from Bristol um, to possibly take these children. Because that's, that's a name that has been given by Miss Harvey. And she's a good enough person to do that. 
to pick up and start driving to Crockett, which is going to be a, a bit of a distance. Now, she's been told you got an option. She chooses to go into the hospital. I believe they, they take her up to the hospital. She winds up checking herself out. She doesn't stay there. And she contacts Miss Leonard, Robin Leonard, um, then comes into the picture. And Miss Leonard, again, had, had gone to school with Miss Harvey, had been a very close friend with her in high school, had maintained contact with her. And you're going to see in this case, um, in January 2021, Miss Harvey escapes the religious cult to come down here. Um, how much of a friend Miss Leonard was trying to be for Miss Harvey. So she's contacted to pick Miss Harvey up at the hospital by Miss Harvey. Um, Alexander Leonard, Miss Leonard's son, will tell you that he drove his mom because she had had a little bit to drink. It's a Friday night. She's at home. She wasn't planning on going out, but suddenly she's got to go out to the hospital. Um, so Alex drives her, picks up Miss Harvey, starts hearing all this story about being followed and the David Crockett thing. They wind up down at David Crockett where the kids still are and I don't know if, I don't know if Miss Lewis has made it there yet or not from Bristol. But Mr. Leonard's gonna say, I stayed in the car, my mom went out, they talked to the officers of DCS, uh, you know, Becky gets there and it's decided that Becky will take the kids but we wind up going back to mom's house on 825 Hamilton Street. All of them. Um, Becky, um, I believe, drives Miss Harvey and the two children in her Jeep, and Mr. Leonard drives his mom back to the house. Mr. Uh, Mr. Leonard will tell you that he didn't stay long. He left, and then the rest of those individuals stayed there the night at Robin's house. Now, over the night, you're going to hear that, and you'll hear this from Miss Lewis, that um, her and Miss Leonard tried to talk to the defendant about the problems that she was having, uh, things that needed, she needed to do, and she'll tell you they wound up getting pretty confrontational with her. They were concerned about these children. Presumably, the defendant gets upset about it. The two girls have gone into like a little side bedroom to sleep for the night, and at some point, Miss Harvey goes in with them, closes the door behind her. And Miss Leonard and Miss Lewis stay behind, and they'll, they'll, Miss Lewis will tell you she hadn't really maintained a lot of contact with Miss Leonard. She, she knew her from school, but they sort of catch up. And then it, they realize they're not hearing anything back from that bedroom. They get suspicious about it. And um, I believe she'll say the door was locked. Miss Leonard gets into it anyway and s opens the door and poof, there's nobody there. These two girls and Miss Harvey were supposed to be in there, were no longer there. And there's a window open where they've presumably gone out. And this is up in the morning. This is, I don't know, four or five, some o'clock, six. It's, it's a, you know, in January, not a good time to be out on foot with two young children. It alarms the two women, obviously. And they start calling in because, you know, at this point, they feel like they're responsible for the children because of what just happened at David Crockett. So they start calling, reporting basically what amounts to a kidnapping. Brings in Doug Hathaway. You'll hear from him. He's a cab driver. He gets a call to pick up someone down at that little store at the intersection I was talking about that's across from the CVS, that little store. He goes down there, there's a woman with two young girls. Picks them up. The woman, who is Miss Harvey, tells him to go back around the alleyway of around 825 Hamilton and she's gonna pick up a bag. She gets out of the car, she picks up a bag, it's got stuff in it. She gets in the car, she directs him to go to a residence 
around Jonesboro to see um, a preacher named Randy Robbins. He pastors a church down there that uh, she had gone to in the past. She doesn't know the address, so she just tells him, you know, it's, you know, turn here, turn there. And um, he pulls into the driveway. She gets out, knocks on the door again. This is early. This is early. And Reverend Robbins finally comes to the door, and you'll hear it. Basically, he told her, get off my property. Okay. She gets for pairing. Um, what was I saying? Okay. Pastor sent her on. She gets back in the cab. Um, she's been telling the cab driver some of these problems she's having of people following her and all this stuff and, um, and about her husband, Mr. Slattery. And she takes her phone and she tells him something like, well, he must be monitoring me here because of what the pastor just did to me. Um, she throws it out the out the window somewhere. They never find that phone later. And at some point, she says to the cab driver, "I've kidnapped my kids." Well, that's cab drivers probably hear a lot of stuff in their line of work, but that raises an antenna for him. And he'll tell you he starts trying to discreetly contact his dispatch to contact John City Police Department and he pulls into a shell station around Boone's Creek, I believe it is. Uh, it's in John City, but it's around Boone's Creek. And um, the police respond. You know, he's trying to, Mr. Hathaway's trying to be discreet about it and not really tell Miss Harvey what's going on here, but uh, that's his plan. And Police officers arrive, and um, of course, I believe they had already gotten calls from Miss Leonard and uh, Becky about these girls being taken out that window. So they were already, Miss Harvey was already a person of interest, so they get a call to meet the cab driver up there about Miss Harvey. So they respond, and uh, DCS winds up coming out, and uh, Jacosha Alexander is the name of that. DCS worker. Miss Leonard and Becky show up at the Shell station, and Miss Leonard's pretty upset. She's upset because of what Miss Harvey has done, taking these children out in the cold. And Mr. Hathaway will tell you, I stayed there. He's not getting paid for it. He's not getting paid for it, but. He's, he'll tell you I wasn't going to let those children out of my sight until I knew they were safe. She wasn't leaving with those children. So um, it's decided then, and I think paperwork is, is, is signed uh, for Miss Leonard to temporarily take care of the children. Now, remember, Monday's a holiday for Martin Luther King Day. So, you know. Courthouses and stuff are closed, or the business isn't going normally. So the plan is going to be on Tuesday, we'll revisit this as to what we're going to do if Miss Harvey's able to take care of these children, or we got to go another route. But we got to do something between now and Saturday and Tuesday. Becky, Miss Lewis, will tell you that her residence in Bristol is tiny. It's 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 like a little duplex apartment on one level. Um, it's tiny. She didn't have room, really, for two children um, that, quite frankly, she didn't know. Um, but Miss Leonard had more room. So there was some discussion. I mean, nobody wants to be mean to these children and all that, but realistically, Miss Lewis uh, felt she just didn't have the space to deal with these children. Plus, she works from home. Um, and the semester hadn't started yet for ETSU, so Miss Leonard reluctantly says, okay, I'll be the one that takes care of the children until Tuesday. Miss Harvey knows this. She signs the agreement, and during that, she's told, don't go 
to Miss Leonard's house until this is resolved on Tuesday. She's told that. Okay, next day, Sunday. Um, there's a birthday party for a nephew of Miss Leonard's. Uh, he's turning 18, and it's, this is COVID time. You gotta remember COVID. Um, people have been shut in, not really been able to get together for um, holidays and things. So uh, this birthday party is a big deal to Miss Leonard to be able to see family, sit down, and talk, and 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 do the things that families do. She wanted to go to that party. There was a concern about taking the children to the party. Um, and you'll hear from Miss Leonard's sister, Amy Grizel, about that. And uh, Miss Grizel even offered, if, if you bring the kids over, then I'll, I'll, I'll go to Walmart and buy them some presents so they don't feel left out. I mean, they're, they're worrying about these girls. Um, but Miss Leonard winds up asking Miss Lewis, Becky, can you take care of these kids just for this one night so that I can do this birthday party? And she says, well, I will. And they, they rendezvous somewhere around Blountville, and Becky takes the children, okay? That's the last Miss Leonard sees of these girls. She goes on to the birthday party on that Sunday. Um, you know, and Annette Harvey is a dis point of discussion between her and her sisters and her son that day. And you'll see the proof that Miss Leonard, going from away from that bar birthday party, her intent was not to let Annette Harvey in her house if she came there. On Monday, the 18th, this is the day of the attack, that morning, and it's around 10-ish in the morning, um, Derek Lawson lives next door on 823 Hamilton Street, and um, he's, he's sort of chilling out there at the house, and he Here's help. Here's the word help, and he hears it again. And it finally dawns on him, somebody needs help. So he, he runs out to listen, and he doesn't hear anything. It's just totally still. Um, so he doesn't do anything more. But he had a surveillance video, uh, or his dad did, at that property, and it's like motion activated. You know, car drives by, it'll preserve a minute, and then next car that drives by, another minute. Um, and it's pointed out towards Hamilton Street. You can't see Robin Leonard's house, but it's just to the left of that camera angle. And you'll see Mr. Lawson on one of those actually run out and look like, what's going on? So you, we don't have like a continuous amount of video that that machine preserved. There's a big gap. But before the, the clip where Mr. Lawson runs out to look, there's a clip a few minutes earlier where you hear furniture getting run into. You'll hear it like something fell over. He didn't hear it inside. You hear it on that microphone on the camera. Around this time, unbeknownst to the neighbor, Mr. Lawson, that's when the hang up call on 911 happens and the call back occurs. Later, I think afternoon, in early afternoon, Pizza Plus is where uh, Bristol authorities are able to find Annette Harvey. On the 29th is when Robin Leonard passes away. So I got one slide there, just it puts everything in perspective because we've got to burn those days of the week and dates in our head. Friday the 15th, David Crockett. Saturday the 16th is the cab and the shell station. Sunday the 17th is your birthday party. Monday the 18th is the attack on Hamilton Street. And apprehension of Pizza Plus in Bristol 20 nights when she dies. Okay, two weapons of interest in this case. There's a ball bat and a knife. 
That ball bat was the, I don't know if it was Little League or Babe Ruth that Alexander Leonard played years before, and he had a bat. And Miss Leonard, who probably didn't believe in guns, living on 825 East Hamilton Street, that was her defense mechanism. That was her weapon if she ever needed it. And they'll tell you where she normally kept it. That knife on the bottom right-hand corner was purchased by Miss Harvey um, early January of 2021 at the Rogersville Walmart. So this is a diagram of Miss Leonard's house. And down at the very bottom where you see the big rectangle in the lower left-hand corner, that's her porch. Um, just behind that is her bedroom. Her bedroom is, is facing Hamilton Street. Hamilton Street is at, is at the bottom below this diagram, okay? The porch faces Hamilton Street. And I had that picture in there described to you. Um, this is from Hamilton Street. You've got the porch over here on the left facing from Hamilton Street. Um, there's a little bedroom on the right and then another little side bedroom over on the right. Um, but where Miss Leonard slept, the master bedroom, faces Hamilton Street, okay? Now at the very top, upper right-hand corner, there's another door. That's the door that goes back to where Miss Leonard would park behind her house in her driveway, and there's an alleyway back behind it. You'll see all these pictures. Um, so there's two doors to her house in the front and in the back. There's where the door is, okay? Proof's gonna be that Annette Harvey comes through that door in the back where someone would park. And that back, the testimony's going to be uh, from the family that Robin Leonard typically kept that bat next to her bed over there uh, toward the corner, propped up, ready if she ever needed it. But on the other side of the house from that door that Miss Harvey enters, the bat winds up being found by the police department in that master bedroom of Miss Leonard's, laying on the floor. The knife in question winds up being found by investigators in the Toyota Camry that had been operated by Annette Harvey traveling to Bristol. John City Police Department, when she's apprehended, takes control of her car, gets a search warrant, they find the knife where that, uh, in that console. They do DNA testing on it. They have to get samples from everybody. Um, Miss Leonard's um, DNA profile uh, matches areas both on the handle of that bat and towards the barrel end of it, part there. And it also matches DNA that was found on the blade of that knife in the Camry that drove to Bristol, operated by Miss Harvey. DNA testing on Miss Harvey found a profile matching the handle of that very knife. So let's talk about injuries. I talked about weapons. Let's talk about injuries. When she's apprehended, Miss Harvey's got a, I don't call it a knot on her head, right up here. That's what she's got. They, they look at her hands. You'll see pictures of the hands. But basically, she got whacked, presumably, with a ball bat. Miss Leonard, however, is a different story. It's not one wound. It's not two, it's not three, it's not four, it's not five. It goes on and on. You're gonna see hands. Um, the woman who did the autopsy on her um, from the, the Quill and College Medicine, uh, she's gonna tell you something in, in her trade, what is called defensive wounds. And what they learn, what they, what they look for, especially in a knife attack, um, she'll tell you, you know, 
person being attacked by a knife, they'll, they'll try to grab the knife or grab their arm, try to make it stop. Well, that puts those hands in danger of getting cut. There's a knife and you're putting it up there. So they look for those on a stabbing case. And what they find is four cuts to her hands consistent with defensive wounds. What about the rest of her? We'll go one by one. Right arm, left hip, sort of left buttock maybe. Behind her left, or right knee, that's left knee, excuse me. Another around the buttocks, and then five in her upper back. 15 knife wounds in all on Robin Leonard. And again, that diagram where the door and the bat are, here's a picture that you'll see in the proof when they did the search warrant in the house of Miss Leonard's. You see the bat laying there right in front of the door. And you see a whole bunch of stuff off of that dresser, consistent with what you heard, what you're going to hear from Mr. Lawson, or that, that video you hear something getting run into. Miss Leonard's clothes tell a story also. Blood saturation. That's blue jeans. That's denim blue jeans. Again, denim blue jeans. Cuts line up to where the pathologist sees them in her work. That's the, uh, presumably that's the back. So, that's the wounds to both of these individuals. Now, what do we know about what happened on January the 18th? We're gonna piece it together by things that the defendant has said <coughs> around January 28th or 2021. One of those things is text messaging. You'll see uh, a history of conversations between her and Miss Leonard. You can gauge for yourself whether Miss Leonard was a friend to her or not. Talking with officers. When she's apprehended up in Bristol, um, when she gets thin ear shots of officers, she'll ask, how's my friend Robin doing? Um, she'll ask, you'll hear this, um, did Robin give a good description of the attackers? And so on and so forth. Now, when someone goes into custody, they make phone calls from about any jail, any prison in America. Those things are recorded as part of the jail security and when those calls go out to a, a husband or a brother or a friend or something like that there's a message that plays to both parties that this is a call from a correctional institution it's subject to monitoring and reporting and then they get to talk so we've got some of these calls that miss harvey makes to mr slattery who she had told officers that you know, he was a cult leader and all that kind of thing. So you'll, you'll get to hear him from these jail calls. Um, early on in January 2021, um, she stuck with that story about Robin being attacked by other people. And she tells her husband an account of having gone over to Robin's house that day, being told by Miss Leonard not to come in there, that she... Um, told the DCS people that uh, you need to call 911 if she comes, so she warns them, but she comes in anyway. And then suddenly these two people masked up or something come out of nowhere, and we're both fighting them. And at some point I get hit with a ball bat in the head, and I leave. 
Days pass, the stories change. I want you to listen for some things, and um, sometimes you gotta concentrate on these calls to really catch things. At first she's saying that these unknown people did this. Um, at times, Mr. Slattery, he's getting updates about Robin's condition. Again, she didn't die immediately. She's on life support for days until uh, the end of life decisions are made. But at times, he'll give her updates. You know, things aren't looking good. I don't think she's going to make it. I want you to notice Miss Harvey's reaction to those statements. I want you to wait, listen for them. This time passes. As Miss Leonard's prognosis is getting more dismal by the day, it isn't any longer third people, or third parties did it, mass people. It's Robin was a mean drunk. She's a mean drunk. She's abusive. Uh, friends told me not to go over there because of how she is, and you know you'll be privy to enough information between. Miss Leonard and Miss Harvey to make a determination for yourself was she a friend or a foe? Finally, you'll listen to a jail call a couple years later. A couple years later, where a discussion occurs between Mr. Slattery and Miss Leonard, or Miss uh, Harvey, excuse me. And Miss Harvey says, Robin died of a heart attack, and they're just blaming me. So, the last thing I want to leave you with, and I want you to pay attention to and we'll talk about it more after this proof. Traffic cameras, um, you drive through John C, you're getting filmed. Um, I, here's no telling how many times you're getting filmed, you don't know it. Um, they've got traffic cameras all the way up Market Street, Rome Street, every one of those traffic lights basically has a camera and um, what you're seeing here is a shot um, from January 2018 on the Johnson City uh, traffic timer it's saying 951 a.m. 951 11 um, and this camera is facing towards the hospital area on Market Street um, if if you're standing there at that camera like this over on your left is the VA in Miss Leonard's house over on the right is um, going up toward Mahoney's and Science Hill Hospital. Uh, that car in the lower left hand corner is the Camry being operated at that time by Miss Harvey at 9.51.11. Um, and the Camry sort of sticks out because it's got a yellow New Jersey plate in the front makes it very unusual otherwise it'd be hard to tell one Camry for another but you're going to see her come down Market Street and turn right and go up the road I think it's called Veterans Way now toward the VA toward Robin's house and then 12 minutes later you're going to see that same car come down Veterans Way and turn right on the Market Street and proceed up North Rome to where it turns on Mount Castle Drive and is caught by some bank cameras and then it's out of the traffic camera view after that. Uh, but you're gonna have 12 minutes of time between her driving up towards Robin's house and driving out of Robin's house. 12 minutes. <laughs> And again, I'll talk to you more about that as it goes. Um, at the end of this proof, you're going to have more than enough evidence to say that this woman is guilty of the premeditated and intentional killing of Robin Leonard and that she did it in perpetration of a burglary, having been told, don't come here. She'll be found guilty. Thank you.